Guys, it looks like we have most people in the room and sitting down. We might have a few late tricklers, but why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to come. Um, those of you who have to, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and the rest of you, thanks for coming anyway. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Thara Kumar. I'm one of the third year residents here in Ottawa. And my presentation today will be about refugee health in the emergency room, and specifically trying to build a framework that applies for emergency physicians. As a quick disclaimer, I'll be mentioning a lot of different resources that are available to you. Don't worry about writing them down. I'll send them all out after the presentation. So, Obviously, there's a lot of discussion in the news right now about refugees. It's kind of a hot political topic, and we know that it's a big primary care issue. But it's kind of an unusual top up topic to bring up for emergency medicine grand rounds. So why is this important for us to talk about? I want to start with a quick poll of the group. So how many of you guys have actually seen a refugee patient in the eMERGE within the past month? So like half the room right there. What about within the past six months? So almost everyone in the room. These are obviously patients that we're seeing in our department. Um, and more now than ever, refugee health is going to be a huge part of our emergency medicine practice. It's not really about the medical knowledge. We're all good doctors. We all know how to take care of our patients. But these are complicated patients whose needs extend far beyond the scope of our typical eMERGE visit. In one 20-minute visit, we're not only expected to manage their acute health issues, but also deal with complex social issues, make up for years of lost health care, and help them learn how to navigate the Canadian health care system. And yet, we get almost no formal training in this area, and every resource that's out there exists mostly for primary care physicians and doesn't really apply to our practice setting. So my objective today is to distill all the information that exists out there into a usable, digestible amount and help you guys actually build a usable framework that you can apply in your day-to-day -day practice in the eMERGE so that the next time you see a refugee patient in the eMERGE, you don't feel like this. So let's start off with a few basic definitions. A refugee. So a refugee is one who has been forced to flee his or her country because of persecution, war, or violence. A refugee has a well-founded fear of persecution because of either political grouping, race, or religion, and that prevents them from being able to continue safely living in their home country. You'll often see refugees subdivided into government-assisted and privately-sponsored refugees. Government-assisted refugees, as the name would imply, are sponsored by the government. So uh, their initial resettlement is paid for by the government, and they're connected with what's called a Resettlement Assistance Program, or RAP, which helps them with things like housing and employment and insurance. Privately sponsored refugees are when individual community groups or families raise the money to bring a refugee family over. And in that case, that sponsor group is responsible for helping them with housing and employment. Health resettlement is the use of evidence-based health assessments and the integration of refugees into the healthcare system. So this is where a lot of us will come in. So I want to talk a bit about who the refugees are in Canada and what this group really looks like. On average, Canada takes in about 250 to 280,000 immigrants across the board who will go on to become permanent residents of Canada. The percentage of refugees that's within that group varies a lot from year to year, depending on the global need. But for the past few years, on average, of the 250,000 immigrants we're taking, about 25,000 or 10% have been refugees. This table gives you some idea about where most of our refugee population is coming from. The majority of Canadian refugees so far in the last few years are coming from the Middle East, primarily Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan as well as parts of Africa, including the Congo, Somalia, and Eritrea. Now, although this talk pertains to refugees in general, I do want to make some specific mention of the Syrian refugee population, just because we're going to be seeing them in such larger proportions over the next few months. Now, you can see from this graph that in 2014, we took about 23,000 refugees across the board from around the world, and just 1,300 of those came from Syria. Syria. 
So that was just two years ago, and that kind of puts into perspective how huge this push right now to bring 25,000 refugees from Syria alone in a span of months really is. To give you a bit of background on Syria, prior to 2011, Syria was a highly developed nation with an excellent infrastructure for healthcare, education, and social services. But since the outbreak of the civil war five years ago, the whole country has been thrown into turmoil. The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimated in 2014 that nearly 11 million people, or 50% of Syria's population, was in need of humanitarian aid. They estimated 6.5 million were internally displaced, and another 4 million had fled the countries, and that's making up the large volume of refugees that we're seeing now. Now, this is a really busy slide. You don't have to know anything that's on there. But this is the Ontario Health Action Plan for Syrian refugees. This is essentially our health resettlement plan. My only point is that there's a lot of stuff going on here. And they make it look really nice. They have these really pretty rainbow-colored boxes and algorithmic flow charts. And my favorite part is in the top corner there where they state the goal of the health action plan, which is to, quote, wrap health services around refugees at each stage of their resettlement journey. So they make it sound really nice, but why with all of this in place are we still seeing these refugees ending up in the emergency room with nowhere else to go? So there's still a lot of barriers that exist for refugees to access health care. Many come from countries where the emergency room is the primary point of contact for health care, so that's just where they're familiar to go. Many don't understand yet how to navigate the Canadian health care system and so they just end up in the emergency room by default. And many aren't able to access a GP even when they try. The amount of paperwork that's required for GPs to get reimbursed for refugee health visits has gotten so complicated that it's a huge deterrent for GPs to actually see these patients. In June of 2015, Dr. Doug Gruner from the Breer Family Health Team surveyed 45 Ottawa walk-in clinics. 43 responded, and of those, 25 said that they would not see a refugee patient unless they paid an upfront fee of $80 to $100 per visit, which is completely out of the budget for most refugees who have just arrived. Four of the clinics refused to see refugee patients at all. So when these patients have nowhere else to go, they end up in the emergency room. So I'm going to lead into a few different topics by walking us through a clinical case. It's a busy night in urgent care. The Alfaraj family, consisting of Amin, 38 years old, his wife Fatima, 32 years old, and their four-year-old daughter Safa, have arrived at the emergency room seeking care. They are refugees from Syria and are exclusively Arabic-speaking. Originally from Aleppo, they fled the war to a refugee camp in Jordan, where they lived for two years prior to being accepted as privately sponsored refugees to Canada. They landed in Ottawa one week ago. The triage assessment is done with the help of an Arabic-speaking patient in the waiting room. This happens commonly. From what you can gather, they've come to the eMERGE because four-year-old Safa has had a fever for three days, with some cough and congestion. Her father, Amin, would also like to be checked because he was previously on an antihypertensive medication and has not been on them or been checked by a doctor for at least two years. So this is a pretty typical triage note that might bring a refugee family into the emergency room. What are your first steps in treating this family in the department? Before we dive further into this specific case, let's take one step back and look at the first step required to treat any refugee in the emergency room. And that's actually identifying your patient as a refugee. This sounds intuitive, but it's actually surprisingly difficult to do sometimes, and the evidence would suggest that we're not that good at this. In her research with refugee patients at CHIO, Dr. Alessandra Ricci noted that only 6% of the refugee patients seen in the CHIO eMERGE were ever identified as being refugees on their chart. And many were discharged home with plans that did not reflect their refugee status. Surprisingly, there's actually no reliable way to tell from an eMERGE ROT if a patient is a refugee. If you're lucky, the more recently arrived refugees may self-identify, or they might arrive with a sponsor or representative who will help you. You can try looking at the insurance portion of the ROT. If you see IFHP, or Interim Federal Health Program, that's helpful because it tells you that that person is currently being insured under the Temporary Refugee Health Insurance Program, and we'll talk more about that later. <laughs> 
The problem is it's not helpful if you don't see that because for reasons we'll talk about later, a lot of refugees might be covered under OHIP very shortly after arriving here. As it stands, the only foolproof way to identify if a patient is a refugee is actually just to ask them. And it's not an offensive question as long as it's posed in a culturally sensitive way. So if your patient seems like a recent arrival to Canada, ask them how long they've been here. If it's less than a year, ask if they came as an immigrant or as a refugee. It's actually a really important question to include on your history because it changes the whole context of your visit for, with that patient. It'll change your differential, it'll change your investigations, and probably most importantly, it'll change your discharge plan for that patient. Now, besides identifying your patients as refugees, there's one more huge barrier that stands between you and providing good care, and that is the language barrier. Now, anecdotally, this is the single greatest frustration I've heard voiced from all of you about your encounters with refugee patients in the eMERGE. And it's a critical first step in managing these patients. Unfortunately, it doesn't really matter how good we are at tropical medicine or knowing our discharge resources. If you can't actually communicate with your patient up front, you're completely crippled in providing them with good care. Now, I know that at some point on a busy night shift in the eMERGE, you're going to be tempted to try to go and get by without using an interpreter. But if I can give you some advice, don't do it. Just don't. You know this is a terrible idea. It's frustrating for you, it's frustrating for your patient, and overall it probably results in poor care. I think we end up over-investigating a lot of these people because we're worried that we're missing something on the history that we didn't get. Now, we actually have access to 24-7 rapid interpretation services in the emergency department, and we have it through CSOC or Cultural Interpretation Services for Our Communities. The acronym is kind of terrible, but the service is actually really good. CSOC offers 24-7 interpretation services in more than 60 languages, including Arabic, Turkish, Kurdish, and many of the common languages you'll see in the Syrian population. Um, and these are interpreters who are trained specifically for medical interpretation, so it's not the same as using a family member or a nurse to translate for you. Um, you can get face-to-face -face interpreters, and from what I've heard during daytime hours, this is actually very reasonable. I've heard as little as 30 minutes to get an interpreter in the department. But if you're working overnight or they can't get you a face-to-face -face interpreter quickly, there are telephone and video conference options that can be set up quickly and are very practical within eMERGE timeframes. To access CSOC, you can just go through TOH locating, or you can call either of these numbers, which I'll send out later. There's a day line and an after hours line. It's not a perfect solution, but I think it's a pretty good option, and it's one that we underutilize in the emergency department. And I would argue that as physicians working in a Canadian tertiary care centre, unless you're dealing with an acute life-threatening illness, it should be considered standard of care to offer interpretation services to our patients. Okay, so let's say you request an Arabic translator through CSOC. This takes half an hour to set up, during which time you see a couple other urgent care patients. Half an hour later, you're ready to go with a face-to-face -face interpreter. You decide to start with Safa. Safa is four years old. She was born in Aleppo, but the family fled to Jordan when she was two years old. She's healthy as far as they know, but she's had fairly minimal interaction with the healthcare system and really hasn't had any regular checkups. She's presenting with fever for three days, cough and nasal congestion, and some mildly loose stool. She's eating a bit less than usual, but she's drinking and voiding well. Vitals are unremarkable except for a temp of 38.9 at triage, which came down with some Tylenol. Physical exam reveals a girl of appropriate size and weight, some nasal congestion, a red throat with no exudate, and an otherwise normal exam. Okay, so you're faced with everyone's worst fear, fever in the newly arrived refugee. But we can handle this together. So I want to take a quick poll of the audience as to what you would do with Safa if you were actually seeing her in your department. And you can choose more than one option if you feel like you would do more than one thing. So first, who would diagnose a likely viral URTI, send this patient home? A few hands, I think almost half the group, maybe a bit more. Um, who would want to do blood work for malaria prior to sending her home? No hands, okay. Who would want to do a chest x-ray to consider TB? A couple of hands, perfect. Uh, a stool sample for GI parasites? We're not loving that. 
And lastly, a swab for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome admit to hospital under quarantine for at least 40 hours, 48 hours or until MERS status is confirmed negative. No one likes that. Yeah. Um, if it's okay, we'll do them all at the end, because I think I'm going to answer some of them as we go. Um, okay, so I want you to keep those answers in mind. We're going to go through them one by one and kind of explain why you would or wouldn't do them. Now, before we can decide what to investigate in any refugee patient, we need to have some understanding of their baseline health status as an arriving refugee. And we need to know what's already been done for us. The healthy migrant phenomenon. This is a concept that's been identified in multiple studies of refugee and immigrant populations. Um, and it's the concept that the population of people who apply for immigration tend to actually have a baseline health status that's better than the country that they're arriving to. There's numerous explanations for this, but the most likely is that we have kind of a selection bias in choosing healthier patients to immigrate. This phenomenon exists a little bit less in refugee populations, but it's still a trend. And the bottom line is these are overall fairly healthy people. All refugees will go through a standard immigration medical exam, or IME, which must be completed by anyone who's applying for immigration to Canada for any reason. This will generally be done prior to their arrival on Canadian soil, except for a few exceptional circumstances. The IME includes a medical history and focused physical exam, a chest x-ray to rule out active pulmonary TB for those older than 11, syphilis and HIV serology for those 15 and older, and the urinalysis for those five and older. It's important to note that a positive test does not necessarily preclude a patient from coming to Canada. It just means that they might need to submit proof of treatment or be followed by public health if they come over. The bottom line here is that refugees are generally healthy. And specifically for the Syrian refugee population, there actually haven't been any specific public health concerns identified in this group. So other than the usual Canadian winter viruses, what kinds of things do we need to consider in SAFA? This can be a really overwhelming differential. But remember that there are evidence-based guidelines that exist to help you. A lot of the recommendations I'm going to talk about come from the 2011 CMAJ guidelines for immigrants and refugees, as well as the updated 2015 guidelines with specific recommendations for Syrian refugees. These guidelines are actually largely a local endeavor spearheaded by Dr. Kevin Potty from the Breer Family Health Team. So let's talk a bit about vaccine-preventable illnesses. This includes things like measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis, polio. And your approach to these diseases in your patient will actually be very variable and patient-dependent. The really important questions to ask are, where has, where has your patient come from? What countries have they traveled through in order to get here? And what were the living conditions like for them along the way? Using resources like the CDC website will help you to determine what illnesses you need to be worried about in the regions that apply to your patient. When you're approaching this in the eMERGE, your time and your options are fairly limited. It can't hurt to ask for vaccination records, but don't forget that these are people who have fled their homes in a setting of war, so many of them won't have access to these records. If they don't have them or you're unsure of the validity of the documents they have, your safest bet is always to consider them unvaccinated. And that doesn't mean that you treat them for everything or investigate for everything. It just means that you keep those things on your differential and still let your clinical gestalt guide you. A really important step for us in the eMERGE is when you see a patient who's incompletely vaccinated, please refer them on to get their vaccines updated. This is mainly being done by Ottawa Public Health and the Breyer Family Health Team, and it's a pretty key part of the health resettlement process. So we can definitely be helpful here. And just a specific note for Syria, prior to the war, childhood vaccination rates in Syria were actually greater than 90%, almost the same as Canada. Unfortunately, current estimates from the WHO and UNICEF suggest that only about 43 to 52% of Syrian refugee children now have their primary series completed. So unless it's clearly documented otherwise, I would suggest that any Syrian child under seven years old you consider as incompletely vaccinated. Also, just keep in mind that varicella is not part of the routine vaccinations in Syria, so that's something to keep on your differential. So malaria, you can kind of approach largely like the fever and the return traveler patient that we're fairly familiar with. It's all about knowing your endemic regions. So again, use the CDC website. They have a malaria map application that can help you determine your patient's risk of malaria. 
Essentially, if your patient is febrile and from a malaria endemic region, they should be tested for malaria. And that includes rapid antigen tests if available and a thick and thin smear. You want to be particularly aware of this in your refugees from sub-Saharan Africa because that's the most endemic population that we see. Syria itself is actually not endemic for malaria, and most of the Syrian refugees that we're seeing are coming through camps in either Jordan or Lebanon, neither of which are endemic. So in your Syrian refugee patient, even if they present with fever, they would not require malaria testing. Tuberculosis. So this is actually part of your routine IME screening for everyone over, than 11, over 11 years old. If active pulmonary TB is identified on an X-ray, then the refugee would have to provide proof of treatment, three negative sputum cultures, and a stable or improving chest X-ray over a time period of at least three months before they would be allowed to enter Canada. If latent TB is identified, they might be allowed to enter right away, um, but they would likely be followed by local public health agencies. In terms of when to think about TB, Think about it if they're from or they've traveled through an area that's high risk. Again, the CDC website can guide you there. Think about it if they have other factors that increase their likelihood of TB. So that's things like being HIV positive, immunocompromised, diabetic, if they've had close contact with a positive case. And remember that refugees have about a two-fold higher uh, risk of having active TB compared to the general immigrant population. And again, using your clinical gestalt, does the clinical picture actually fit? According to WHO estimates in 2014, Syria actually has a really low rate of TB, about 17 per 100,000. And that's actually less than the rates in Canadian-born Aboriginal populations. So TB is not a high risk factor in this group. HIV, this is also screened as part of the routine IME for anyone over 15. So most adult refugees that you see will know their status. But also be aware of the additional cultural stigmas that exist around an HIV diagnosis. There may be some reluctance to disclose that diagnosis to you. In Syrian refugees, this is fairly low risk. The incidence of HIV in the Middle East is less than 0.1%. Hepatitis B has a fairly moderate rate, less than 6%. Hepatitis C, less than 1%. But the key point to know here is just that Hep B and C are not screened as part of the IME. So your patients may not be aware of their status when you're testing them. OK, so let's talk a bit about GI parasites. Now, there's a ton of GI parasites that can affect this population. But the vast majority of them are self-limiting and don't require any intervention. So you don't really need to keep them on your differential. There's only two bugs that you need to keep on your radar because they're potentially deadly and they're also treatable. And that's schistosomiasis and strongyloides. Schistosomiasis is actually very common. It's second only to malaria in terms of global parasitic disease burden. It's caused by worms that thrive on freshwater snails. And it mainly so far has affected the African refugee population. The severe symptoms of schistosomiasis are actually not from the worms themselves, but rather from the eggs that they lay that then lodge into your various organ systems. When patients get infected with schistosomiasis, they're often asymptomatic initially. A couple of months into the infection, they develop a kind of flu-like prodrome with fever and rash and myalgias. And then eventually, the adult worms begin producing eggs. And when these eggs become lodged in end organs, they can cause failure to the liver, lungs, bladder, or CNS system. For example, in the eMERGE, you might think of this if you're seeing a patient from an endemic region who's presenting with hepatitis NYD, or hematuria, or in rare cases, even seizures. The treatment is an antelminthic agent, uh, uh, agent, but the regimen is quite complicated, so I'm not going to go into that. The key point is if you're seeing this in the eMERGE, you should be getting ID and public health involved. So strongyloides is a nematode, um, and it's a nematode that infiltrates the skin, often secondary to people walking with bare feet on soil. The incidence in the Middle East is less than 5%. Most often, strongyloides just manifest with a chronic mild GI infection, and you won't have to worry about it. But you should know about the acute life-threatening illness that can develop with strongyloides hyperinfection syndrome. And this occurs in the setting of a chronic infection in someone who then develops impaired immunity. And the most common cause of that is actually us when we prescribe steroid medications. 
This can result in an overwhelming gram-negative sepsis, shock, and an ARDS kind of picture, with a 70% mortality rate if untreated. The treatment is firstly to treat the worm with ivermectin or albendazole, and secondly to treat their clinical picture, and you manage the shock or the ARDS the same way you would in any other patient. Needless to say, these patients will often require an ICU admission. Okay, so I want to specifically address the issue of MERS screening in the Syrian refugee population, because there's been a lot of confusion around this topic in the past. You may have heard specifically about the case that happened at CHIO in early January, where six refugee children were sent directly from reception house to the CHIO Emerge with one day of fever. And all six of those kids ended up admitted under full isolation precautions for several days until all of their MERS testing came back negative. That's kind of a big deal. That's six kids admitted to hospital at the same time with airborne droplet contact and complete isolation precautions for at least 48 hours until their MERS testing came back. The eMERGE was left with no remaining isolation rooms for most of the day. The eMERGE staff spent about four hours of her shift just dealing with this, and ID staff had to be called in. Now that's a lot of resources because some kids had a day of fever during RSV season. And the really unfortunate part of that is that there actually hasn't been any MERS in Syria so far. The issue is that most of the Syrian refugees, as I mentioned, are coming through Jordan or Lebanon, and Jordan has had a few reported cases of MERS. So now we have thousands of Syrian refugees arriving to Canada during peak viral season. They haven't seen these viruses before, and they're all getting fevers. But when they come to triage and they've been to Jordan, they automatically screen positive for possible MERS. Now, what typically happens if someone screens positive for MERS, but they're looking clinically well enough to go home, is that swabs are sent, and then they can actually be discharged home, as long as they remain under quarantine at home until their MERS testing comes back. The issue is that most newly arrived Syrian refugees are living in uh, temporary housing, like reception house, where you have dozens of families living in very close quarters. So quarantining at home isn't really possible. And that was the reason that the six kids at CHIO all had to be admitted. But practically, this doesn't really make sense for such a low-risk population, nor is it sustainable. So now we have these modified screening recommendations specifically for Syrian refugees and MERS. So when a Syrian refugee arrives to the emergency room, they'll go through the standard triage questioning. They'll be asked about fever and respiratory symptoms within 14 days of having uh, traveled in a country affected by MERS. And in this case, we're thinking about Jordan. If, uh, if their screening is negative, they go through standard practice. If positive, they will be placed under airport, um, airport, airborne <laughs> droplet and contact precautions in the eMERGE. But then at that point, you can do an additional screening step. So you ask them, in the 14 days before, before the onset of their symptoms, did they have contact with a hospital system in Jordan? And did they have contact with camels? I know that seems like a weird question, but it's because camels have been known to be a vector for MERS. And just for your own information, it's not just actual camels. It could be camel meat, camel milk, or apparently camel urine. I don't know under what circumstances that would happen. But this is the question that you ask. If they say yes to either of those questions, or if they have a clinical or radiologic picture of ARDS, then you still have to think about possible MERS. And that means that you contact Ottawa Public Health, you send them for testing, and they have to be placed under quarantine until their testing comes back. Whether that happens at home or in the hospital will depend on that refugee's living situation. But for the vast majority of refugees who will say no to those questions and who will look clinically well, you can just stop there. No further MERS workup is required, and you can discharge all precautions. So hopefully that's going to save us a lot of admissions in the future. The key underlying message of this whole section is that we probably worry a lot more about communicable disease in the refugee population than we need to. It's good to be vigilant, and you always want to have the zebras on your differential. But just remember that we have thousands of patients arriving to a new country during peak viral season. Most of them are just going to have the same kinds of things that we have. So back to four-year-old Safa with her three days of fever. At this point, there's no indication to test her for malaria, TB, stool parasites, or MERS, and she most likely just has a common viral URTI. So you encourage oral intake, you encourage monitoring her temperature, and you refer them to the Breer family health team to get her vaccinations updated. Okay, so let's turn our attention towards Amin. Amin is 38 years old, 
He discusses that he has a family history of early hypertension and that he was started on a blood pressure medication several years ago, but that with all the recent turmoil in his life, he hasn't been on meds and hasn't been checked for at least two years. His blood pressure at triage is 180 on 110. He wants to know if he should be started on medications again, and he wants to know if you prescribe something, will it be covered under his insurance? So this bridges us a little bit into healthcare funding for refugee patients. I won't spend a lot of time on this because it's not really meant to be the focus of the talk, but I think it's really useful just to have a basic understanding of how funding works for refugees. So the Interim Federal Health Program, or the IFHP, is a program that was established by the Government of Canada in 1957. And you may have heard about this. It's a pretty hot topic in the news right now. It's a program that was designed to provide temporary health coverage to act as a bridge until refugees were eligible for provincial coverage. From 1957 until 2012, all refugees and refugee claimants received full coverage under this program. So that included basic medical coverage, that's things like family doctor visits, eMERGE visits, and nursing care. That included supplemental medical, so that's things like vision, dental, and mental health care. And it included basic prescription medication coverage, which is pretty similar to what's covered under ODB. And they were eligible for that until they had provincial health care coverage or to a maximum of one year. Just to put into perspective how much this program was actually costing us, you can see from this chart, and this is derived from 2007 and 8 data, that on average the health care cost per refugee claimant was about 10% that of the average Canadian, or about $500 versus $5,000. But despite this, in June of 2012, the government made dramatic cuts to the IFHP that essentially eliminated vision, dental, and mental health coverage, as well as prescription drug coverage for large groups of refugees. Despite claims that this would save hundreds of thousands of dollars, numerous studies, including one in Toronto and one done by our own Francis Bakewell as his research project, show that the costs have actually increased and they're just being downloaded from a federal to a provincial level. In July of 2014, the federal court declared that these cuts amounted to cruel and unusual treatment and were an outrage of Canadian standards of decency, and they ordered a reversal of the cuts. Since then, we actually haven't seen a full reversal of these cuts, but there have been some modifications made, and the end result is that now it's really confusing. So now there's a bunch of categories and subcategories. Um, and you don't need to know all of that. In this table, I've tried to summarize kind of the three main groups of refugees that I think you might see. Type 1 coverage is basically what everyone used to have. So that's basic, supplemental, and prescription medication. Currently, that only applies to government-assisted refugees, as well as to children under the age of 19. They've created a second subgroup for pregnant women who are not covered under Type 1, and so they get type 2 coverage, and that means their basic medical care, eMERGE visits, doctor visits, and prescription medications, but they don't get access to uh, supplemental things like vision, dental, and, and mental health. And finally, type 3 includes basic care and prescriptions only for illnesses that are considered to be a public health safety concern, and that applies to all privately sponsored refugees as well as most refugee claimants. Now, the Syrian refugees are being considered sort of a special group because they're part of a special humanitarian project by the government. So they're all being granted type 1 coverage, meaning that they'll have coverage for everything. And if you're still really confused, don't worry about it, because last week, after years of lobbying from physicians and concerned public, the Liberal government actually announced a full reversal of these cuts. So as of April 1st, all refugees will once again have coverage for basic medical, supplemental, and prescription drugs, which will make things a lot better for them and a lot easier for us. It's really good news, although it, it did kind of mess up my slides for this part of the presentation. <laughs> so the bottom line for the IFHP is that it's temporary health care coverage for refugees to bridge them until provincial coverage, like OHIP. For the Syrian refugee population, it's pretty straightforward. They should all have access to basic, supplemental, and prescription drug coverage. For the others, it can get a little bit confusing, but until the cuts are fully reversed, and even after, a good basic principle is just remember that usually your emergency services will be covered, but keep your prescriptions to a minimum. And when you're prescribing, try to prescribe things that would typically be covered under ODB, because it's usually similar coverage. <laughs> 
So you repeat a blood pressure and the reading remains elevated. You decide to start him on some medication, but you want to make sure that Amin has appropriate follow-up for this and that he can get checked for other chronic medical issues. So what chronic health issues do you expect to see in this population and where can you refer him for care? The key point of this section is just to understand that although there's always a lot more public buzz and discussion about uh, communicable and infectious diseases in refugee populations, by far the vast majority of health problems that we'll see in this population are just chronic health illnesses that we're very familiar with that haven't been treated for many years. I obviously don't have any specific numbers for this, but if Rob was up here, he'd be throwing away the whole cheesecake. <laughs> so, most of the conditions that you'll likely see in the refugee population are the same diseases that we see in the Canadian population. Things like poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension and heart disease are common. You may see nutritional deficiencies and iron deficiency anemia. And specifically in the Syrian population, although they're rare, think about G6PD deficiency and thalassemia as well. Uh, many refugees will land in the eMERGE because of neglected vision and dental care. And anecdotally, we've actually been seeing a lot of Syrian refugee children coming to TOH with dental problems. So where can you refer these patients to get services? Now, the first step in getting refugee patients connected with a health system is getting them access to culturally appropriate primary care. There's a few family physicians in Ottawa who are accepting these referrals, but by far the biggest referral base is the Briere Family Health Team. They've actually been working directly with resettlement assistant programs like Refugee 613 to organize and run special clinics for new refugee patients with interpretation services and physicians who are knowledgeable about the specific needs of refugee patients. One of the most valuable resources that I only learned about when researching for this project is the Refugee Health Toolkit. The toolkit is a 20-page publicly available PDF document that was created through the Refugee 613 Health Task Force. It can actually be downloaded from the Somerset West Community Health Center website, which you'll see in the top corner, but I'll send you all a copy after the presentation. Um, and I'll see you about getting this updated onto our info net, because I think it would be useful to have access to on shift. The toolkit contains Ottawa-specific information regarding referrals for things like vision care, dental care, and a host of other services, and it's specifically targeted at refugees who are newly arrived to Ottawa. For each service, the toolkit lists specific, um, specific people that you can refer to, as well as the languages of service that they offer. And this can be done either by physician or by self-referral. They even offer this Multicultural Health Navigator program, which is designed to help new refugees navigate the Canadian healthcare system. Health navigators can provide education about the Canadian healthcare system, can make appropriate referrals on behalf of their patients, and can even accompany refugees to their first few health appointments. The take-home point from this section is just that most of the illnesses we'll see in refugee populations are chronic illnesses that we're actually quite familiar with. The challenge is that in the emergency room, we really can't make up for years of lost health care in just one visit. And that's why an awareness of our disposition resources is essential to allowing us to discharge these patients with more than just a Band-Aid solution, but actually a health care plan. So, you provide Amin with a 30-day prescription for Norvask. Because Amin is a newly arrived, privately sponsored refugee, and he's part of this Syrian refugee group, his prescription should be covered under the IFHP Type 1 coverage. You refer him to the Briere Newcomer Clinic for follow-up, and you also connect him with the Multicultural Health Navigator Program to help him fill the prescription and coordinate his family's ongoing care. At this point, you ask if there's anything else you can do for the Alfaraj family. You notice now that Fatima has been very quiet throughout your encounter, and you see that she's now tearing up. After some provocation, she tells you that she's been feeling very overwhelmed. The last five years have been difficult. She's relieved to be in Canada, but she's feeling overwhelmed by all of the change. She feels afraid to leave the house alone, and she feels guilty for having left behind so much extended family in Syria. So what resources can you offer to Fatima? The key point here is just to understand that mental health issues are a big concern in the refugee population. They've been exposed to violence and trauma. Many of them have lost family members and lost their support systems. 
Common issues that you'll see in this population are depression, prolonged grief disorders, anxiety disorders, and PTSD. And particularly vulnerable subgroups within the refugee population are unaccompanied refugee children, older refugees, refugees who are also victims of sexual or gender-based violence, and those who have experienced torture. And again, be aware of the cultural stigmas that may exist around disclosing a mental health diagnosis. Now, the challenge is knowing how to handle these issues from the ED. Of course, if someone is acutely in danger, you can still refer them to psychiatry like anyone else. But most of the time, they're just going to need a safe discharge plan. As per the CMAJ 2015 updated guidelines, the evidence actually recommends against routinely screening patients for mental health concerns. And the thought is that this might actually induce more harm than it does good. But if a refugee comes forth with information suggesting mental health issues, it's crucial to know where to turn for culturally appropriate community referrals. Although our usual UCC psychiatry clinic is an option, they're not really specifically equipped to deal with the special needs of a refugee patient. So instead, the Briere Family Health Team is a great referral base. They have two psychiatrists, a psychiatric nurse, and a social worker who all have vast experience working with refugee populations. Another great local resource is the Ottawa Community Immigrant Services Organization, which offers all kinds of counseling services, as well as cultural integration programs. And these are offered by appointment or by walk-in, and by patient or self-referral. So the bottom line here is just to be aware of the prevalence of mental health concerns in refugee populations, and also be cognizant of the barriers that might prevent them from disclosing those to you. So, you provide Fatima with a referral to the Briere Family Health Team Mental Health Clinic. You review the care plans for each member of the Alfarage family and ensure through the interpreter that they understand their discharge and their follow-up plans. They leave the department feeling reassured. And that's our case. So, I hope that by actually walking through that process, you get a better sense of how the different pieces come together to actually caring for a refugee family out of the emergency room. Remember that the first step in treating any refugee is actually identifying them as a refugee early on. Like I said, it sounds silly, but we're not that good at doing this, and it really does change the context of your whole visit with that patient. Take the time to get an interpreter. Even though it can be kind of a pain, remember that nothing you do downstream from that step will matter if you can't effectively communicate with your patient first. Stay focused on the chief complaint. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the broad differential that can apply to refugees, but use your clinical judgment and use resources like the CDC website and the Public Health Agency of Canada to limit that differential to what you really need to think about. And remember that this is a largely healthy population. And finally, get to know your local resources. Good disposition planning is difficult in this population, but without it, all of the effort you put into your eMERGE visit can come unraveled the minute they leave your department. Ottawa actually has a really great infrastructure for refugee patients, so tap into those resources and send patients out with a plan that does more than temporize, but actually links them into a health resettlement plan. I think it's clear that refugee health is no longer just a primary care issue. In an increasingly globalized world, immigrant and refugee health is going to be a bigger and bigger part of our scope of practice, and we need to be comfortable with it. This is undoubtedly a challenging group of patients with complicated healthcare needs, but I hope that after today you feel a bit better equipped to handle these patients in our department. So I just want to say a quick thank you to a lot of people who helped with this. Uh, Dr. Sarah Adelman, who is my supervisor for the project, the whole Briere family health team, and especially Dr. Doug Gruner, who put a lot of work into reviewing the slides, Dr. Jeffrey Turnbull, Avik Nath, and Hassan Sheikh, the staff at CHEO, especially Dr. Charles Huey from Infectious Disease, Dr. Langevin, who's here today, uh, Dr. Ricci, who shared some of her data, all of my wonderful co-residents, and Ravin for watching this presentation more times than anyone should ever have to. <laughs> So with that, I'll take any questions, and maybe we can do what Rob did last week with the microphone.